Last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday. I don't like to refer to it as Easter Sunday because of all the connotations with the word Easter, rabbits, bunnies, and all those kind of silly things. It's Resurrection Sunday. And uh, I often feel that the resurrection is a cheated truth in the Christian world. Have you noticed, in the church, we almost spend six or seven weeks building up to the Incarnation. And the early church really didn't celebrate the Incarnation, but what they did celebrate was the fact that Christ had died, Christ was alive, and he was coming again. And so the resurrection is often squeezed into a week, and then we just move on. We're going through a series looking at rooftops in Scripture, and I thought, even though we're only two weeks into that, we'll just put it on hold for one session, because I want to speak about the resurrection. Let's turn to Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9. I'm not going to read these chapters, but I'm going to refer to them as I speak for the next few minutes. As you go through Acts 8 and 9, you'll notice there's one word that occurs five times. And therefore, I want to speak about these five occasions when that word occurs. It is the word arise. Arise. I have never been knighted, uh, and the way things are going, I don't think I will be knighted. But I do know from people who have been knighted that the first word they hear after the sword has been placed on their shoulder is, Arise. Arise, Sir David. That is the key word of Christianity. It is arise, get up. We know that's certainly true in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. We worship a risen Savior. And the glorious message of Jesus Christ is this, that he rose again from the dead. We worship a living Savior. I've come to realize that in Western Christianity, our understanding of Christianity is this, Read about him. Study him. Now, don't get me wrong. My study is full of books, and I love reading about the Lord Jesus Christ. But he didn't say, David, study me. He said, follow me. Follow me. And I find it very interesting. I was reading Martin Luther this week, and uh, Martin Luther had a number of dark sides to his character. He said, if you really want to understand the gospel, he said, read Romans. No. If you want to understand the gospel, listen to the Lord Jesus. He is the gospel. He is the gospel. And we follow him. And in following him, we find that we have a wonderful Savior, a man who walked all the way to the cross, and then died, and then rose again, and is alive forevermore. Arise. And sure enough, on Resurrection Sunday, he rose again from the dead. But also in relation to us, is it not true that when we come in contact with him, we likewise arise? The Bible says, and we dealt with it last time when we looked at Scripture together, that Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 says that any person outside of Christ is dead in trespasses and sins. And, And dead people are going nowhere, and dead people soon start to smell. And any person who is outside of Christ is going nowhere, and there is a smell of death about them. But when the Lord Jesus comes in contact with a dead person, arise. And what happens? That person rises again on the inside and is a new person in Christ. And furthermore, it hasn't yet finished. We're going to rise at the end. What a day that's going to be. We just throw these scriptures around and go, that's very nice, that's very interesting. The Bible says when he comes, the dead in Christ will rise again. There's going to be a terrific shout. There's going to be a wonderful blast of the trumpet, and it will be, rise. It's like when the Lord Jesus stood outside of the tomb of Lazarus. The literal Greek is incredibly powerful. Our translators have really couched their language and hidden the power. Jesus stood outside of the tomb of Lazarus and said this, literally, Lazarus, out! That's authority, isn't it? And the man had to obey the authority of Christ. And he arose. He wondered what had hit him. Well, it's going to happen to us at the end of the day. Out will come the message from the Lord. Out! And the dead in Christ will rise first. Here in Acts chapter 8 and chapter 9, there are five people who came in contact 
through his servants with the resurrected Lord Jesus. And the first word they heard was, Arise, get up. And everyone arose to something different. And uh, I don't know where you are in your Christian life or where you are this week, what's going on. But who knows, in these five occasions that we're going to look at, the Lord may have a relevant word for someone, and I trust for all of us. In Acts chapter 8, verse 26, we have the first arise. And an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Here's a man who arose to evangelism. This Philip here is not Philip the Apostle. This is Philip the Deacon. And, and amazingly, he had a wonderful ministry among the Samaritans. That's radical. Here's, here's a Jew having a wonderful ministry among the Samaritans. Things were going well. We're told if you read Acts chapter 8, people were getting converted. Some people were being healed. Those who were demonized were being set free. And who wants to leave a mission like this? But amazingly, God spoke to Philip and said, Philip, get up, arise, and go to a wilderness. Why? Because there's somebody there I want you to speak to. And so we're told that Philip traveled south. And sure enough, he must have had a lot more information than we're told here. Because this is a pretty big area. Lord, what am I going there for? Who am I going to speak to? He knew when he saw what he saw, this is what I've been sent for. He was sent to speak to the Chancellor of the Exchequer for Ethiopia. Can you think of all the pomp and the ceremony and the entourage? I have so many questions. Number one, how far did he travel to actually see this man? And if this man is the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which I believe is true according to what the Scripture says here, he would have a guard. How does this traveling preacher get close to this political entourage and say, I've got a word from the Lord? How did it happen? I don't know. It's a bit like Moses. I mean, Egypt was the most fortified empire of its day. How did Moses and Aaron get through all the security to actually get to the throne room to speak to Pharaoh? I mean, they were shepherds. They would smell like shepherds. Well, Moses would. Long hair, dirty clothes, walking to this pristine palace. How did he get there? Likewise, how did this man find his way all the way to the chariot of the Ethiopian unit, the Chancellor of the Exchequer? And when they met, what language did they speak? Now, this man had been up to Jerusalem. And one of the things he'd bought in his spare time was a scroll of Isaiah. Now, I don't know if you know how big a scroll of Isaiah is. Mm -hmm. The Jews speak about the major prophets and the minor prophets. And we think, oh, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, because they're big books. Well, Daniel isn't a prophet. He is a prophet. The first person to call him a prophet was the Lord Jesus. But if you read the Old Testament, in, in, uh, as the Jews have it today, Daniel is among the history writings because they saw him as a politician. It's Jesus who said, oh no, sometimes history is prophetic. So the three big prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, are called the major prophets. Do you know why? Because each of those books takes 36 feet of scroll to write out. All the others, the other 12, go on to one 30-foot scroll, 36-foot scroll. So he went for the biggest, the 36-foot with Isaiah. They didn't read like this. You've watched too many television films. <laughs> they read like this. Okay, how many times do you have to turn a 36-foot scroll to get to Isaiah 53? That was pretty lucky, wasn't it? So here's this chancellor of the exchequer reading Isaiah, and he's turning it. How many times did he turn it? And when Philip comes alongside, He's, he's reading Isaiah 53 and has no clue what he's reading about. And so he says to Philip, could you explain this to me? I love it. It says, Philip told him about Jesus. 
he told him about Jesus. So here is the Ethiopian eunuch. He has a scroll in his hand. He's got a question in his heart. He's got a preacher in his chariot. He gets a message in his ear. He gets a confession on his lips. And he finishes it with joy in his heart. He gets converted. Wonder of wonders, he then gets baptized. Who says that baptism is not part of the salvation package? Surely it is. Repent, believe, get baptized. It's, it's part of the whole thing. I'm a new person in Christ. Now I call this one-to-one -one evangelism. Now, I don't think I'll ever be called to speak to the Chancellor of the Exchequer in this country, let alone Ethiopia. But all of us, surely, should hear the Lord say to us on a regular basis, get up. Get up. And go and tell somebody about the Lord Jesus. And there are many ways of doing that. And therefore, we must never feel guilty as if, oh, I'm doing it wrong. No, no, there are many ways. There's the confrontational way, like Peter on the day of Pentecost. You sinners, you crucified the Lord Jesus. Repent. And sometimes in our evangelism, we must not be sort of uh, merely mouthed and, and afraid of speaking the truth. Sometimes people need to be told, you need to hear about Jesus and get right with him. But then there's also the intellectual approach. When the Apostle Paul got converted, we're told that he went around all the synagogues reasoning, <coughs> logically explaining to them, listen, the Lord Jesus is the Messiah. He didn't stand in the synagogues and go, you wicked people, you need to repent. No, he explained logically from the scriptures. Sometimes that approach is needed. And then there's the blind man approach. I know people who couldn't take a degree in theology if they tried. But they love the Lord. And they're like the blind man in John chapter 9. Oh, I don't know, but one thing I do know is this. Once I was blind, but now I can see. And I've had people sort of speak like that as I've talked to them. You, you kind of, you pull your hair out theologically going, oh, they're all over the place. And yet they love the Lord. And God uses them. And there is that kind of approach in evangelism. There's also the Samaritan woman approach. She was well known in the town. And when she met the Lord Jesus, she invited everybody. And I've come across people and heard people testify that, that when they became a Christian, they invited all their non-Christian friends to a meal. And then said, listen, you need to know I'm a changed person. And the reason why I'm changed is because I've met the Lord Jesus and this is how it's happened. They've sort of set out their stall. Well, that's what the woman of Samaria did. I think Matthew did that as well. What an interesting uh, meal that was that Matthew put on with all these tax collectors and sinners. And then he said to the Lord Jesus, would you give a little word? <laughs> little word? I would love to have known what the Lord Jesus said to those people. And then there is the service approach. We'll come to Dorcas towards the end of the sermon, so when you hear the word Dorcas, you can wake up. It's the final point. We're told that she did wonderful good works that caught the attention of people in the area. And you know, there are people like that. Maybe they're not the best of speakers. They're not confrontational. They can't argue like the Apostle Paul. But there's something about their life and the way they live that touches people, that gives them the right to be heard. And so I say to myself, David, it's all right you preaching this on a Sunday morning. Do you ever talk to people about the Lord Jesus? When you're part of an established church, you think that evangelism is inviting people to church. We've got a lovely ladies' meeting. Why don't you come along? And we've got fair trade coffee and, oh, <laughs> Doris makes some wonderful biscuits. Why don't you come along? We're a friendly bunch. Or why don't you join our gardening club? You know, that, that kind of stuff, that's not evangelism. Evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. That's evangelism. And all of us need to do it. And I work on the principle where if they think I'm an idiot, they probably won't have to see me again anyway. 
I was reading a short while ago something that I've learned a long time ago, but you sometimes forget and you have to refresh yourself. A Sunday school teacher felt very exercised about one of his pupils who every Sunday afternoon fell asleep when he was giving his lesson. Thinking this is not the best way to try and reach my class, he took it upon himself to go around every member of his Sunday school class and ask them, have you ever thought of yielding to the Lord Jesus? Just so happened that this boy who kept falling asleep worked in a shoe shop. So he went to his place of work and said to the boss, do you mind if I just have five minutes with this young man? Yes, it's fine. He explained to him the gospel and said to him, have you ever thought of yielding to the Lord Jesus? And the great thing is this, he was awake. When he walked away from the shop, this man, Edward Kimball, said, I felt such a fool. I'd made a mess of it. We've all been there, haven't we? A wonderful opportunity comes. We say, I blew it. I blew it. What a, what a waste. And here's me asking the Lord, give me an opportunity. I get one and I blow it. He felt like that. Unknown to him, this young man went home and got on his knees. Felt very challenged about what he'd heard. You may have heard of this man, I don't know if you have. He was called D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody then went on to become a well-known evangelist, who then came to this country. When he came, not many folk knew about him, and he wasn't very well received. But one man called F.B. Mayer stood by him, and things began to get better. At the end of their time together, D.L. Moody said to F.B. Mayer, if I invite you to America, would you come and preach for me at a week's conference? F.B. Mayer said, you invite me, I'll come. And so sometime later an invitation had come and F.B. Mayer came and F.B. Mayer went to America to speak at this conference in Northfield. He was preaching his heart out at this convention. There was a man there who was a young minister who was just... He was going nowhere. Nothing was happening. He felt so discouraged. And F.B. Mayer was preaching on the lines of, are you willing to give your all to the Lord? And if not, are you willing to be made willing? That's, that's challenging, isn't it? Are you willing to be made willing? And this young man stood up and said, I am willing to be made willing. He was called Wilbur Chapman. He then went on to become a God-honored evangelist. And in middle life, he held a campaign at Charlotte in North Carolina that was so blessed of God, the people there said, you know, we've got to pray that we can do something similar and that God can work as he's just worked. They began to meet and pray and covenant with God to pour out his spirit. They organized another campaign. They invited a man called Mordecai Ham. What a name for an evangelist. Certainly don't use that name to reach out to people who eat pork. But anyway, Mordecai Ham. It was so blessed of God. And there was a young man there who heard Mordecai Ham preach. You may have heard him, called Billy Graham. And when Billy Graham came to this country and preached, one of my relatives got converted. And it's still going on. And Malcolm here. And all this from a Sunday school teacher who felt he'd made a mess of it when he went into that shoe shop to say to Dwight Moody, have you ever thought of yielding to Christ? Who knows? Who knows? The knock-on event when we speak to somebody about the Lord Jesus I was talking to a lady in her late 80s last night. She telephoned me. She said, listen to this, David. I was in Morrison's the other day. And you know how it is? You go into a supermarket and all the newspapers are there. She said, there was a man reading the front page of all the newspapers. And I was walking past. He just said to me, isn't the world in a terrible state? She said, yes, it is. But can I tell you about a man who sorted me out? <laughs> Who's that? The Lord Jesus. She said, David, I had a wonderful opportunity to tell this man in Morrison's about the Lord Jesus by the newspaper stand. And when it was all over, he shook my hand and said, thank you. 
Who knows the, the impact of that? I was walking down a country lane just last Saturday. I was walking down and I saw a man and a woman walking towards me. They knew, they knew that my job is speaking God's word. I've spoken to them before, but it's probably over a year since I spoke to them. I stopped and said, hello, nice to see you, nice to see some sunshine. Then she said this, do you do christenings? <laughs> what now? <laughs> Lord, what do I say? This is what I said. I said, do you think pouring water over the head of Mr. Putin will make him a better person? She said, oh, no, 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 no. It's his heart, isn't it? I said, therefore, do you think that pouring water over a baby's head will make any difference? Hmm, you've made me think, she said. Let's take every opportunity that God gives us. And so here is Philip. Little did he realize the implications of him leaving that mission and going south, going to a desert, speaking to this man. Who knows what happened after that man went back to his job and to his country. He arose to evangelism. And then there's the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 verse 6. He arose to adventure. Remember how we'd met the resurrected Lord? So he, Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise, get up, and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The conversion of the Apostle Paul is legendary. And uh, if you go down to Covent Garden, if you've been to Covent Garden recently, but there is the, uh, there's the Actors Church. It's where there's lots of plaques and memorabilia to people who've been in the West End and, and who wanted some little plaque there that thought would remember them. Outside the church, there is a recent bit of modern sculpture of a man on a horse falling off the horse, and it's soil of Tarsus. It's absolutely amazing to see. I love it. Everyone knows of the Apostle Paul who was converted on the road to Damascus, his Damascus Road experience. If you read towards the end of Acts chapter 26, Paul speaks about using his hand to vote for the death of Stephen. This seems to indicate, we cannot be 100% sure, but it seems to indicate that he probably was a member of the Sanhedrin in the raising of his hand. That's an official thing. So yes, I, I was part of, of, of voting for the death of, of Stephen. That being the case, I wonder after his conversion if he ever went back to his office to clear his desk. And also, what was, what was the crack among all the fellow Sanhedrin members as to, have you heard, have you heard? He's been smitten. You're joking. Yeah, he's come, I bet he's got converted. Come off it. No, it's true. Did he go back and tell these men what had happened to him, or did he think, you know, knowing how we work, or used to work, it's probably best to keep out of this environment. But anyway, he arose. In one instant, this man's life entirely changed. In one second. And that's how it is with the Lord, isn't it? And when, when God steps in, in one second, things can change. That is the romance of Christianity. And I live in that romance, thinking, Lord, it is grim, it is dire, but I cannot rule you out of the equation. And so in one second, the man he thought was dead was alive. That was a shock to the system. Because before this, the Apostle Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, saw that the resurrection was a bit of a joke. But suddenly the man he thought dead was alive. Suddenly the heretic became the truth. Suddenly he realized these people, the church, they are the people of God. The temple and Judaism itself became defunct. The Lord Jesus he saw as God's only begotten son. And Stephen... He saw in a new light, he's a martyr. He's not a terrorist. He's a martyr. He's a martyr for the truth. 
And here's Paul. Can you, can you picture this man if he was a member of the Sanhedrin? Well-dressed, well-spoken, well-respected. He's on the floor in the dust, groping around, probably with a mouthful of dust, probably hurting uh, and trembling, having seen the Lord. He says, what do you want me to do? And he said it blind. How interesting the Apostle Paul saw more with his eyes closed than he did with his eyes open. It's as if God had to close his eyes to open his eyes. What do you want me to do? Back came the message, get up. Get up. There were other people around, by the way. Scripture tells us that. How embarrassing. Anyway, he got up. He arose to three things. You find that in verses 15 and 16 where he's later told. You are being told to get up to a life of privilege. You are a chosen vessel of mine. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 15 of his first letter, he admitted, the Greek is very powerful, he said, I was an ectopic pregnancy. Which means, technically speaking, I shouldn't have been born. And, and naturally speaking, there's no way I should be a Christian. But I am. God has moved in supernaturally and I've been born again. And I am now a vessel of the Lord. When Paul wrote to Timothy in his second letter in chapter 2, and verse 20 and 21, he said, all of us are vessels. All of us. Oh yeah, he was a chosen vessel in a very unique way to speak to Nero. We know that when Paul was on trial at the end of his life, he stood before Nero. So Nero heard the gospel from the Lord Jesus. Far, sorry, from the Apostle Paul. We're vessels. Who knows who will drink the gospel out of us? Who knows? I had a lady in one of my congregations. I'm almost nervous to mention this. She loved writing to everybody. And I wish at times she'd told me who she was writing to because if I was giving an illustration in a sermon and she thought it would be helpful for them because it mentioned them, she'd, she'd, she'd send them the CD. I once gave an illustration of, about Ronnie Barker, which I'd read in the book. I'm so glad I got it right. She thought, I'm going to send it the CD. So she sent Ronnie Barker this sermon where I was quoting Ronnie Barker for him to listen to, to see what he thought. Why did you not tell me? He wrote back and said, very interesting. So she sent another one. And she kept sending CDs to Ronnie Barker. Every time I see that man on television, even though he's dead, I think, I preach to you. <laughs> Did he respond? I don't know. But you know something? You can reach people I'll never reach. Just be yourself in the Lord Jesus. For we are chosen vessels to serve him. That's the privilege. And what is the purpose? To speak to Gentiles. That was Paul's primary mission. He also spoke to Jews, but primarily he spoke to Gentiles. God hasn't said to me specifically, David, you must only speak to Gentiles. He said to me, go into all the world and tell everybody. Isn't it wonderful to think we have a message that is for everybody? I find that wonderful. And here we are, 2,000 years later. It almost seems to me, this is a heretical statement, but you know what I mean. It almost seems more relevant now than it did 2,000 years ago. Here we are, 2024. The gospel seems so real to me. What a purpose. Oh, Paul, there's pain as well. Oh yes, there's privilege and there's purpose, but there's pain. You're going to suffer for this. And when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and 2 Corinthians chapter 11, oh boy, 
did that man suffer. And Philippians 3 verse 10, that I may know him, yes, of the power of his resurrection, ah, yes, and the fellowship of his suffering. There's great privilege and there's great purpose in following the Lord Jesus, but boy, there's a lot of pain. There is a lot of pain. But it'd be worth it when we see Jesus. Arise to adventure. And then there's Ananias. In chapter 9, verse 11, he was told to arise to service. So the Lord said to him, Ananias, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. What kind of quiet time was that? Maybe he just came aside and was just quietly meditating on the things of God. And God, how did God speak to him? Was he audible? Or was that just an impression? A friend of mine was telling me that one of his friends, he's now with the Lord, was awakened in the night with a verse for him. And, and, and he woke his wife up and said, have you got a pen? No. Have you got paper? No. I've got a pencil. That'll do. He wrote the verse on the wallpaper that when he got up in the morning, he wouldn't forget it. And here's a man just, just quietly getting on with his life, and God broke in and said, I want you to go to the house of Judas in a street called Straight because Saul of Tarsus is there praying. You've got to get that right. Because for all he knew, this man was still the arch enemy of Christianity. And I'm sure that there was some interesting discussion that is hidden in the text that is not here between the Lord and Ananias saying, you're not serious. Here I am, send my wife. Lord, you know I'm not a deacon. I'm going to pass it to the diaconate. Better still, give it to the elders. I don't know what went on between the Lord and Ananias, but he arose. And he went to that house. And there's Paul, praying. I love this. It's one of the most powerful statements in the whole of the New Testament. Ananias, when he met the converted Saul of Tarsus, now the Apostle Paul, he reached out his hand and said, Brother Saul, brother. It's great saying you want to serve the Lord on your own terms. My terms are wonderful. But the trouble is the Lord never reads my terms. And when you serve the Lord, you have to serve him on his terms. And I'm sure if Ananias had shared this with his friends, they'd have said, you're crazy. You are crazy, man. Are you asking to get us all killed? Well, you know he's not a believer. He's an enemy of Jesus Christ. But he was so in step with the Lord, he knew he was right, and he went on his terms, not his own terms. And I find it incredibly difficult, if I'm honest, serving the Lord on his terms. Because his ways are not my ways. And his thoughts are not my thoughts. And furthermore, I sometimes feel the Lord saves the wrong kind of people anyway. No, I, Lord, I wouldn't save that person. The trouble. The trouble. One man said, some of us are like wheels. We don't work unless we're pushed. Some of us are like trailers. We have to be pulled. Some of us are like kites. We're always up in the air. Some of us are like canoes. We need paddling from behind. Some of us are like footballs. You never know which way they're going to bounce. Some of us are like flat tires. We always need pumping up. The person then said, all that we could be good watches, pure, gold, open-faced, always on time, dependable, quietly busy, 
and just full of the good things of the Lord. Lord, I trust that when you speak to me that you find me a cooperative Ananias. I've got a very lengthy quotation here. I won't give it to you. It's by Mr. Spurgeon to his congregation at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. I wouldn't dare say these kind of things. Uh, but he said them. He said to his congregation, just paraphrasing, he said, the trouble with some of you is this. You go to too many Christian meetings. You go to conferences, he said. You go to meetings. You surround yourself in a Christian world. He said, it's time some of this came to an end. Go and meet real people. Meet real people. And when the opportunity arises, tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be interested to know that at the end of his ministry, Mr. Spurgeon baptized 15,000 people. That's not bad, is it? 15,000 who came to the Lord. But a lot of that wasn't just him, but it was people who took his word to heart and said, yes, the Christian life isn't a perpetual Keswick or Word Alive or always listening to Christian CDs. It's living a real life in the nitty-gritty of life but taking with me something of the fragrance of Jesus. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. In fact, sometimes we have too much time on our hands. John White, remember the Christian psychologist, said most Christian meetings exist to stop Christians getting bored. And some of us need to get a life, just go out there and to live a normal life and to start meeting real people. That's great. I love walking around the village. You never know who you bump into. Have a little chat. Ooh, you're not working? Well, I do work. What do you do? Well, I teach the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? Oh, I don't know about that. But it's an opening, isn't it? It can't always work like that. Sometimes I just walk around and see hairs. It doesn't matter. But when God gives an opening, Lord, may I arise to it and not be ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in Acts chapter 9, verse 34, here's the fourth one. A character called Aeneas. He arose to health. Acts chapter 9 and verse 34. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. It seems that Peter was working up and down the seaboard if you look at Israel today, you've got Tel Aviv. Below that, you, uh, you've got Gaza and Gath and Ashkelon, where all the trouble is taking place at the moment. So you have all that, Tel Aviv, and then you go north to Caesarea and so on. Peter was going up and down that area, sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When news came that there's a man here who's been bedridden for eight years, now, I don't know about you, am I allowed to say these kind of things? As I get older, I don't need as much sleep. And so, eight hours in bed seems endless. Eight hours, you look at the clock, it's four o'clock. Can't get up. Can't get up at four o'clock, it's ridiculous. Uh, five o'clock, eight years this man had been in bed, bedridden. He was a needy person. His name is Greek, but don't be deceived and think that he was probably a Greek, because Philip, the deacon, Philip is a Greek name. Philip means liver of horses, but Philip was a Jew, both deacon and apostle. So my understanding is this, this man was uh, a Jew, he was a local man, and uh, I don't believe he was a believer. Why is that? Because it says, a certain man called Aeneas. But when you come to the next story, Dorcas, a certain believer. I'm not going to make a categorical rule out of this. I'm going to say, generally speaking, there are maybe a couple of exceptions in the New Testament. But generally speaking, everybody who was healed in the New Testament was an unbeliever. No, I'm not saying, that's the last thing I'm saying, is that the Lord doesn't heal believers. Of course he does. But I'm talking about the examples that we have here. So when Jesus was ministering primarily, 
he healed unbelievers. Okay, there was Peter's mother-in-law, but was she a believer? I don't know. She could well have been. Dorcas, she was a believer. Yeah, but she was dead. So a certain man, he was a very needy person. But Peter followed a very necessary pattern. He spoke with authority. Wow. Have you ever seen that kind of authority? It wasn't a matter of quick, I'm going to send a message up to Jerusalem, get praying, this is serious. He was an apostle. There's no getting away from the fact that apostles moved in apostolic authority. And he went in and with authority spoke health into this man's life. And then what about this? He said, get out of bed. Best, isn't it? You are healed. Now get up. I love the words of Charles Swindle. He said, this was real power. Some of us have been saying to our teenagers for years, arise, make your bed, <laughs> with no results. <laughs> so, out, make your bed, now go. It's like the man who was led on a bed by the pool. I once heard a man say, he went in with his head on the bed and came out with a bed on his head. Because <laughs> he went home carrying his bed. And here, where, where did Peter get this authority from? He got it from the Lord Jesus. I don't know anybody in my entire Christian life who moves in that kind of authority. I'm not all that sure that we have it, to be honest. But there is an authority that comes through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is that authority that we can speak powerfully and say, but this is the truth. And it was the truth that set this man free. But look at the noted procedure. It says, All who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? They turned to the Lord. When you read through the Acts of the Apostles, this is maybe a little thing you may want to do this week. When you read through the Acts of the Apostles, there are seven occasions when it says, People turned to the Lord. That is conversion. People turning to the Lord. My heart aches for people. How I long to see people turn to the Lord. It, it seems such a long time since I could probably count on one hand the number of people I know recently who've turned to the Lord. And when it does happen, it's been so long since it's happened, you become suspicious. Really? We better put you on probation. How about this? In the middle of the last century, there was a well-known German theologian. She was called Etta Linnemann. She was a liberal. She loved the writings of Rudolf Bultmann. Rudolf Bultmann, you cannot get more liberal than Rudolf Bultmann. I mean, what Bultmann believed could be written on the size of a postage stamp. She wrote books about what Bultmann said. She adored his teaching. And then how about this? At the age of 50, she got converted. What did she do next? She made a public announcement to all her fellow theologians to say, all the books I've written, all the articles I've written, all the magazines I've written for, put them in the bin. They're nonsense. I've now discovered Jesus. Wow. What would that happen if a few of our bishops got converted? Or a few ministers? To say, you know, I was just a rank unbeliever. All I was doing was engaging in some intellectual exercise in the world of theology. And then I met the resurrected Jesus. The same happened, by the way, to Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas is acknowledged by the Roman Catholic Church as probably the greatest theologian. But what they don't tell you is this. At the end of his life, Thomas Aquinas had a conversion experience. And then he said this. 
All that I've ever written and all that I've ever said is but straw, burn it. But today people quote Aquinas pre-conversion. No, no, after he was converted, he said that was rubbish. Quote him after his conversion. Oh, no, no, we don't do that. It's being unfaithful. Here was a man who, who had an encounter with the gospel through Peter, speaking with authority, and the proof of his conversion is this, that many people turn to the Lord. Let me finish. Time has gone very quickly. Maybe not for you, but it has gone very quickly for me. In Acts chapter 9, verse 40, we have the final arise in these two chapters. It's Dorcas who arose to new life. Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Wow. That's amazing, isn't it? While he was down in the area, news came to him that this woman was dead. Well known for her sowing, her kindness, and things of that nature. And what is Peter doing here? He, he's, he's acting like the Lord Jesus. Remember when the Lord Jesus went into the home of Jairus, and there's a little girl, and he took hold of the little girl's hand and said, Talitha Kumai, my little girl, arise. One gets the impression at times the Lord despaired of the disciples, have I been with you so long and still you don't know? He must have been thrilled when here is Peter walking into a room saying to a woman who's dead, arise. And she got up. Dead people don't get up. Owen Glendower, that famous Welsh nationalist, said to a friend, I can speak to the dead. Ah, said his friend, but do they listen? <laughs> here, here we find Peter spoke to this woman and she arose. Wow. What a witness she must have been. What a witness she must have been. I could say so much about her. You work that out for yourselves. I just like the way he dropped on his knees. Just dropped on his knees. It wasn't him. Lord, you come and do something. And the outcome was new life. And there was joy. God said to the children of Israel before they went into the promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 6, You have stayed here too long. Break camp and get up, arise, start moving. I sometimes feel that in my life as I look back, I've heard the Lord say to me, David, you've been here too long. Break camp. It's time to get up and stop studying. Now is the time to start following. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that Jesus Christ is alive, that we serve a risen Savior, and that people who come in contact with a resurrected Jesus are themselves resurrected. They have to rise. And Father, we give you thanks that the rising isn't over yet. There's going to be one massive cataclysmic rising when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And those who have already passed and those who are dead will rise up to meet the Lord in the air. And we shall rise too and get a brand new body. Father, I just pray for this fellowship here at Aidsdale. May it learn to arise, to stand up, to do whatever you want it to do. But Lord, may it not stop at the bottom of the mountain. May it stand up and do what you want it to do, that people around this area may realize 
God is not dead. He's alive. I can see it in the lives of these dear people. Father, I thank you for these folk. Thank you for their sincerity, for their honesty, and for their love of the Lord Jesus. Oh, Father, bless them. Do their souls good. And encourage them in the things of God. Because I ask it in the name of our resurrected Lord Jesus. Amen.